Welcome to The Record. I'm Mark Maxwell. Thank you for joining us. We are watching the shifting political ground across the country. Term election results scattered what Republican dreams were of a red wedge in key leadership positions in Illinois politics. And House Republicans in Congress decided to move on from uh, the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy. We went to Springfield, Illinois yesterday to sit down first with Democratic House Speaker Chris Welch, who is now inheriting the largest supermajority in Illinois history since 1980, when Illinois cut back the number of politicians in the state legislature. Right before the election, a few months before the election, one of the last things we heard from you on the record was that Democrats were bracing to sustain some losses in a red wave. It didn't quite materialize. You've got five more Democrats and the largest House majority ever. What changed? How'd you do it? Well, we knew a red wave was very possible this year. History was not on our side. Uh, but we've broken trends in Illinois before, and I knew that we could break the trends again. Uh, and the only way to do that was to do the work. Uh, that work started over a year ago. It started with having good candidates. Uh, our incumbents had great records. Our candidates were excellent candidates that we recruited. Uh, and they did the work. Uh, they inspired their volunteers to get out there and knock on doors. Uh, they worked harder than their opponents. Uh, and our message resonated with voters. Uh, certainly, uh, our economic message vo uh, resonated with voters. But the Dobbs decision was monumental. It was huge here in Illinois. Uh, and that really helped Democrats. Republicans questioned that logic or that because they said, well, in Illinois, there's a constitution or there's the closest thing to a, a guaranteed right for abortion in Illinois, maybe more abortion protections anywhere than any, anywhere else in the state or in the country, rather. Where do you look to in, in data, in anecdotes that's, that proves to you, indeed, the Dobbs decision played a role in electing Democrats? I look at the outcome of the elections. Uh, I said in several speeches that I gave over the last few months that Rovember was coming. Uh, and the information that I was receiving from people that were knocking on doors and what people were talking about. Uh, when you look at the data and polls, when you look at what people were saying uh, they were hearing at the doors, Rovember was coming. Uh, and it wasn't just here in Illinois. Uh, people underestimated the power of women. They underestimated the power of uh, 18 to 24 year olds. And those people came out and spoke in droves. Uh, and th that happened in Illinois and all across the country. Uh, many political observers in Illinois might remember that when, when women in the House Democratic Caucus rallied around you to make you speaker, a lot of them remembered and spoke fondly about your support for reproductive rights uh, during your days as just an ordinary member of the House. Is there still something you think is left unfinished on that front? Is there more work to do to further ensure or enshrine abortion rights in Illinois, or is that fight mostly over? Well, I certainly think there's more to do, uh, because right now we're uh, a single legislature or a single Supreme Court away from losing those rights. And so we have to always think about what, what more can be done. Is there something else we can do that will further guarantee a woman's right to choose here in Illinois. Uh, as the father of an eight-year-old, I think about that every day. Uh, and that's why I appointed a working group uh, headed by Representative Kelly Cassidy to work all spring, summer, and fall to come up with some recommendations uh, for us to consider. Uh, and I'm looking forward to them reporting back to the caucus uh, and us taking up their recommendations. When we sat down for an interview at your district office, you spoke quite candidly about the fact that the, the redistricting process is inherently political. Did you see that in the outcome? What role, if any, did the map making or the gerrymandering power play in helping Democrats pick up five new seats? Well, for me, what was driving me uh, as the leader of our caucus uh, and the leader of this chamber was the diversity of our state. I saw that this state, in terms of demographics was extremely diverse. Diversity is the strength of our state. And so what was driving me during that whole process was any fair map, because you heard a lot of talk about fair maps, had to be something that was going to produce and reflect the diversity of the state. And if you look at the results of this election, they just happen to be Democrats. 
We elected our first uh, Vietnamese. We elected our first Korean. We elected our first Arab American Muslim. We elected our first Indian American Muslim. We elected a whole lot of firsts. And our caucus today looks a lot more like America and a lot more like Illinois because those maps produced diversity. And I think that we did a pretty good job. Do you have any regrets around how uh, the district represented formerly by LaToya Greenwood was drawn? Well, I got to say, I have regrets that we're, we lost Leader Greenwood because she's a dynamic member of the House, a dynamic member of my leadership team. Uh, but it's certainly reflective of uh, how that area is changing. Uh, you know, we got to do the work to change it back. Uh, we got to go knock on doors and listen to people and see if we can uh, address their concerns. Uh, but right now, the data says that area uh, is changing and our message didn't resonate with them. Republicans hammered Democrats on concerns of crime and predicted a purge in Illinois when the end of cash bail comes on January 1st. How would you grade the effectiveness of that message now that the voters have weighed in? It was clearly an F. It failed. And it was failing from the start. Uh, it was never landing any blows. And uh, my job was to make sure people didn't panic because we were tracking it very closely. We anticipated that attack, so we were prepared for it, and it didn't register. Uh, lies and fear-mongering never works. Talking to people about their hopes and the change that they can believe in is what they want to hear. Uh, and that's what we did. And our job was to make sure the members and our candidates that we supported understood that the lies and fear-mongering wasn't working, stay on message, continue to knock on doors, continue to talk about the things that, that matters to them, and you will prevail. Uh, and certainly, uh, that's what happened. I know you've got a lot of staff that help you analyze bills, and you're the speaker. You've got your mind in a lot of places. But have you read all 700-plus pages of the Safety Act? I have not read every single page, but I've read, read it through. Uh, when I say read every single page, as a lawyer, I like to dissect and dissect and read things two and three times. I have not read that two and three times just because of the sheer volume of things I'm dealing with as a speaker. But do you... When you hear people say there's parts of it that are confusing, state attorneys, many of them suing the state right now, saying mm -hmm. we don't know which criminal defendants we can put in jail before their trial and which ones we have to let go, judges themselves aren't quite sure yet. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize those concerns, separate and aside from the political noise? Well, we said even uh, before it became an issue in the campaign that we were going to address some of the clarifications uh, that are needed uh, in a subsequent trailer bill. We've already done three trailer bills to the initial bill that passed in January of 2021. Three that are been signed into law. We're going to do a fourth. We've said that from day one. When we left here in April of this year, I appointed a group to specifically look at the Safety Act, and they've been meeting with all of the advocates, including state's attorneys, and the state's attorneys, before they started engaging in lies and fear-mongering during a campaign, knew that we were at the table continuing uh, to work on this bill. And I do believe we're going to get a fourth trailer bill done that continues to clarify some of that language that everyone admits is confusing. Uh, this is a good policy. Before January 1st? Absolutely. During veto session? That's the goal. Can you, and I know that maybe the language is still um, being drafted, but can you clarify the aim of, of what it is you, what, what is the line that you want to be able to tell state's attorneys and judges, this is the clear red line, criminal defendants on this side of it can wait until their trial, criminal defendants on the other side of it are the ones that are going to have to wait for their trial in jail? Well, I have a group that's been specifically tasked with working on that, and they're going to be presenting to the caucus, and I don't want to get ahead of them, uh, you know, and that should be happening very soon. Uh, and they're going to have recommendations to us. We're going to vet those recommendations, uh, and then we're going to move them forward. But they're, they're, what I have been told is that uh, there are going to be recommendations brought forward that everyone agrees on. And when I say everyone, everyone that's in our working group, uh, and they have the support of the advocates. But for the people who might have voted for uh, in this last election, and they've heard a lot of that noise, they're sitting, they want to hear from the Speaker of the House about the future of the Safety Act, and they've seen claims like a person accused of second-degree murder, which I know is a rare charge, but someone in that category 
might be let out. To that, to that concerned citizen, you would tell them what? That that was lies and fear-mongering. Even under the current version, before we pass clarifications, a judge, uh, if a person is a danger to another person or a danger to the community, under the law, come January 1st, as currently written, a judge can detain that person. Uh, a person accused of attempted murder, a judge can deem them uh, a risk to a person or the community uh, and retain, detain them in jail. Okay. It would not be uh, someone that you would give cash bail to. I, I hear you. Uh, and we can move on because I think we're going to be very interested to cover that debate over the next two weeks as it develops. Um, this is a new two-year term. You're going to swear the oath of office in January and uh, take the gavel again for two years. We didn't hear a lot from Governor Pritzker on what exactly he wants to do in his next four-year term. Are there some specific aims that you hope House Democrats can advance, things in the law you want to see change? What are the top few priorities for Democrats in the next two-year term? Well, I certainly think we have more work to do. I, want to, I think we need to continue to build on our budget success. Uh, I think part of the reason Democrats were successful was because we actually had a good fiscal record to run on. We have to continue to build on that. I think if you look at the working groups that we've put in place, there's going to be some things that come out of those working groups that help set our priorities. Uh, there's more to do uh, on women's reproductive health. There's more to do when it comes uh, to gun control and common sense gun laws. Uh, you know, I certainly think an assault weapons ban is something that uh, we need to take a good hard look at. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, huge topics ahead and certainly some things in the education space that we can do. Uh, that Cheaper college tuition? Cheaper college tuition. You're always trying to make college more affordable. You're always trying to make sure uh, pre-K through 12 you're offering the best options to families. Uh, there's a lot more to do. Governor Pritzker did suggest he wanted to see uh, some plan, we haven't heard specifics, on providing cheaper college tuition. What did you make of this news that President Biden's student loan debt forgiveness plan is now tied up in limbo in the courts? And what can the state do? As Is there some alternative? Well, I was disappointed to see uh, a federal appeals court in St. Louis uh, put that on hold because that is certainly within the president's power to do. It was the right thing to do. It was responsive to middle-class Americans and folks out there that are struggling uh, to get by right now. You know, we have so many people that uh, receive PPP loans uh, that had those loans forgiven. And today, it's many of those same people that are against folks having their student loans forgiven. That's hypocritical. It's disappointing. And the right thing to do uh, is to try to give these folks uh, an opportunity uh, to contribute to society. And just lastly and quickly, I imagine we might hear some remarks from you toward Leader Durkin uh, on the floor. Anything you'd like to say to him directly before he leaves his post? Well, I got to tell you, you know, 22 years ago when I ran for a school board in my community, a nonpartisan position, Leader Durkin was one of the first people that supported me. Uh, you know, I'm forever grateful to him helping me get involved in politics. Uh, I've enjoyed working with him. I mean, we've had our differences, trust me, uh, but I've, I've enjoyed working with him, and uh, I wish him all the best. And I certainly look at this as an opportunity to build a relationship with a new leader. Uh, hopefully they will learn from the lesson of this election that extremism is not the order of the day. Hopefully they can come a little bit more toward the middle, and we can all work together and find some compromise and continue to move Illinois forward. After our interview with Speaker Welch, we went and met with Minority Leader Jim Durkin just as he was packing up his office. The Republicans have nominated Representative Tony McCombie to replace him in the next two-year term in the super minority. But before he left, we wanted to hear his perspective from the Republican side. What message did voters send and what message did politicians hear during the election? Speaker Welch said some nice things about you. Uh, as you step away as minority leader. He also said the election results showed Republicans a few lessons that maybe extremism uh, isn't a winning strategy. Do, do you see any truth in that? I see 100% truth in that. We have allowed the, the far-right extremist to control the primary, also to control the messaging in Illinois. And it doesn't work, particularly where I live in the suburbs areas that we were competing in the collar counties and the suburbs don't want extremists. They want people who have a moderate position from government. And 
even though we had candidates that were moderate, we were defined under the Donald Trump and Darren Bailey narrative, and that was a failure and it hurt us. Whose fault is that? Well, I would just say that uh, a lot of it has to do with the right wing. We have lost so many people in the Republican Party who have turned into independents, and that just allows just the far right, uh, the far right of the party to control who is going to be nominated for statewide elections. And we should have learned something on Tuesday that you cannot nominate a Darren Bailey and expect to win in the suburbs and the car counties when he has an extreme position on everything. So is the Illinois Republican Party a party of ideas or a party in search of ideas? Well, I tell you what, we have good ideas, but none of it broke through. What we, we were outspent, that's one thing. But every one of us, were, we were kind of thrown into the same, same mixing bowl by most people in Illinois, and particularly in the areas that We're competing as part of the Trump Bailey Republican Party, and it was very difficult to break free from that. For as long as I've covered you, uh, you've always sort of not wanted to engage the national political discussion as That's much correct. in Illinois. No. But but you're a McCain I'm Republican. I'm a John McCain Republican, not Absolutely. a Trump Republican. That's correct. And Trump spoke to a wing of the party, the, the working class base of the new Republican Party, in a way that I don't know the lawyer, lobbyist, insider, Republican class ever connected with. No, that's correct. But the fact is that fell apart after he lost the election. We're a nation that we have to accept uh, you know, winners and losers. He lost the election, and he kept uh, flaming the, the, the embers about the, the big steel. And when January 6th came about, everybody watched that, and that will go down as one of the worst times in American history for generations to come. And what did he do? He did nothing. And it's still, I'll wait to see what the committee does on, on his participation, but he did nothing to stop this revolt against our capital, against our democracy. That is when he lost it. And he had just, he is now, the people that he had brought in who felt that they never had a voice, they're like, this is not the type of government that I want. And he was left with the extremes and the fringes, and they're still on it. The election deniers, the January 6th sympathizers, and also everybody believes that, you know, that this election still was stolen. And he still is continuing with that. And he is, you know, it's just unfortunate that he can't accept a loss. And he should be doing it for the, for, for the, for the Republican Party in the country. There is so much fatigue with Donald Trump. And David Brooks said it's... Uh, particularly well the other day, he said, we, hopefully we've, we've gotten, we've, we've broke our fever on Donald Trump. But he is a person that had his opportunity. He just can't accept that he has lost a race. But people who are following him and people who continue to fall on a sword for him need to realize that he would never do the same for them. You just, but you, I understand the part, the part, uh, the point you're making about the relationship between politicians and other politicians within the right. party, but there's also that relationship between the politician and the base. You can't win without voters. Correct. And Donald Trump did turn out voters in greater volumes. How, how do you keep his base and ditch him? Well, you know what? Time's going to tell. I don't think that the former president has good days ahead. And obviously him moving up his announcement to run for the presidency may have something to do with the investigation that is going on with the Department of Justice. But I will just say this, that there are other good conservatives out there. Such as? Such as Ron DeSantis. You don't I see think, him as another version or iteration of Trump? No. What did you think about his busing migrants from Texas to Florida, flying them to Martha's Vineyard to trick them? That's part of the business that we're in. Uh, I don't consider that an extreme, but you know what? There's been so many issues regarding immigration. The Democrats have had the bully pulpit for so long. They want to make, make all kinds of noise about being a sanctuary city or sanctuary state. Um, you know what? Fair game. But I don't consider that being a, you know, a disqualifier for Ron Santos. Or Nikki Haley, I think, is an outstanding, outstanding person. I spent some time with Mike Pence over the summer. He's a very honorable man. These are all very conservative individuals that will still be able to appeal to the base but we have to, people have to look in the rearview mirror with Trump and understand that his days are over. That Maybe. We have to be able to give the party over to the next generation. 
This is a line I never thought I would use in an interview with uh, leader Jim Durkin, but let's steer it from national politics back to Illinois for a minute. Sure. Uh, because I, I understand you're making a point there, but on Illinois, when you look at the election results from this last November, Amendment 1, the Workers' Rights Amendment, polled higher than every statewide Democrat in almost every single county. In very few instances did Democrats poll higher than the Workers' Rights Amendment. What does that tell you about the electorate in Illinois, and what should that, what signal should that send your caucus about the future of its relationship with labor? I've spent a lot of time over the past four years trying to repair some of the problems and, uh, you know, build the bridges that we lost under Bruce Rauner. We did. And you know what? I, I, under Governor Pritzker's first session, I worked with him, and I also worked with, uh, you know, the building trades on the, on the capital program. That was a a very important step for us to move back in that direction. But I will say in the Constitutional Amendment, quite frankly, most people didn't know it was in it. It sounds good in its face, but the fact is most people don't understand what the short-term, long-term implications are, and quite frankly, neither do I. And everybody's got their own theory on it, but it sounds good on its face. But some of these, these Constitutional Amendments, if you dig into it and you really try to play out different scenarios, you're not sure if you're, what you voted for is what you expected. I, I understand you could, a lot of people could interpret it. Lawyers could have all kinds of opinions about sure. what it actually means. But the, the spirit seems to be there. The votes seem to be there. That polled really well. Of course. It's a blue state. That's well, it's a what union state. To, it's a union state. It's a blue state. And figure out a way to work with labor, particularly the building trades. That is what we lost touch under Bruce Rauner. And again, like I said I've spent a little time over the past four years trying to repair those relationships. Because a lot of the men and women that work in those building trades, if you think about the profile of them, they're conservative Republicans when it comes to most of the issues. But when it comes to labor management issues, if we continue to take a position contrary to them, we're just losing out. You and your resume, your background, you were uniquely qualified to comment on the end of cash bail. Yes. And you hammered the Democrats over the Safety Act, the end of cash bail. Did voters buy it? No. No, they didn't. Did you overplay your hand? No. It's reality. This, I'm trying to warn people about exactly what they should expect and what's in this bill. So and voters I, just didn't hear enough of that message? I, I, you know what, as I felt that that was a, you know, the economy and the Safety Act, public safety, were one and two. And that is what our polling showed. And I can only rely upon polling and also the information I'm getting at the door from my candidates. And everything was about the economy. It was about crime. But when I find out after the election that more people are concerned about the, the future of the democracy of this country because of what's going on with Trump and also the, the January 6th hearings, but also him sticking his nose back into this process, that's a greater concern to people. And you know what? If that's what it is, so be it. But we were right on the issues. We were right on the economy. We were right on public safety. We were right on parental involvement with their children's lives. These are the things that I would say, resonated so strong over the last four years, but we lost on election day because of extremism and also an extremism is part of the Trump, part of the Bailey narrative. You're still, you, you still, you're still here. You're still a member. Correct. Uh, the, maybe there's a passing of the torch uh, in, in the days or hours to come to Correct. Tony McCombe. I think it looks like she has the votes. While you're here, Speaker Welch just told us moments ago he's committed to seeing a bill advance that will clarify the Safety Act before January 1st. Is there any version of that bill that is not just repealing the whole bill that you could vote for? Well, they've never invited myself nor anybody from my caucus to any of these, these meetings that they're having, these working, working groups. I would strongly suggest to Speaker Welch to allow myself and also some people in my caucus who've actually tried cases like myself, understand the criminal justice system, to provide some type of uh, you know, our thoughts. Let me give an example. Two years ago, Representative Slaughter presented a bill that was going to outlaw deception during interrogations of juveniles. I'm a prosecutor. That doesn't sound like tough on crime. I worked it, and I rewrote the bill for him. I did it, and I was the co-sponsor on that bill. And I made a good concept, and I turned it into a great bill. And it got overwhelming support in the House of Representatives. That's what I bring to the table. And I hope that Speaker Welch would learn from that episode, that moment from a few years ago, that I'm not here just to say no to everything. I have the ability and I have the, the, the background to be able to turn something that I consider a bad product into something that's workable, that's fair. Could this be your final act to I would have just say that I would, I would welcome the opportunity. And I, if that's the case, I would, I would be honored to do so. But I have to be invited to the table. Which criminal defendants or which charges 
should automatically or clearly in that new law become part of a judge's discretion for pretrial detention in jail or not? We've had this big discussion on what is a detainable and non-detainable case, non-detainable uh, offenses. And people, the governor said there's no such thing as a non-detainable offense. No, well, sorry, governor, you invented Well, a misdemeanor it. would be a one. misdemeanor, I'm not concerned about right. that. But when we have a lot of people that have been, you know, we use the examples of kidnapping, strong arm robbery, arson. But to me, no narcotics case, no matter how big or small, can ever be detained. I was a special prosecutor in the narcotics unit. I spent a lot of time investigating gangs and cartels back in the 90s. And to say that a person who's going to be charged with trafficking kilos of heroin and fentanyl would not qualify for a detention hearing because, one, they are not, it's not a forcible felony, even though some of them are non-probationable. They would have can, to can, can I just ask a quick follow-up sure. question? Because I, don't most of those suspects or defendants carry weapons? And using a, a weapon in the commission of that crime, doesn't that make it detainable because they're, it's a high Higher charge, no? It's not a UUW. It would be it'd have to be a, a, a. I don't. It would be. It's a class three felony, along with the class X. I don't believe that's the case. But a lot of these cases, just someone who is charged in one of these busts that we see on the highways. I live right off the heroin highway over in eighty eight. Mm -hmm. We see them all the time. Where it's, sometimes there are firearms, whether or not they can tie that up to upgrade. But if they don't, just the sheer fact that someone is trafficking, or someone. is delivering a, a, you know, a, a huge drug deal, that the only way they can be detained if they are deemed to be a flight risk. And under this law, you cannot use that person's background on skipping out in court cases or prior warrants to establish that they're a flight risk. It's an impossible standard to meet. So, so you'd like to see that standard expanded or clarified on the flight risk? I think that we have to be realistic about some of these offenses because most of these cases which are not going to be detainable in the future, uh, people are being held because they've got very, very serious criminal history. They've got bad backgrounds and they have flight risks. They've had prior violent crimes. You can't consider that again when these, starting January 1st for these non-detainable cases. You can only determine whether or not they're a flight risk. Uh, you told me off camera that you'd be voting for Tony McCombie to become the new House That's Republican correct. leader. Uh, do you have any interest in being a backbencher? You know what? I'm getting through this process right now. It was a, it was a, a bittersweet decision that I made, uh, but it was the right decision for me, the right decision for the caucus. Uh, I will just say this, that uh, uh, I'm looking forward to working with uh, Tony McCombie, giving her some guidance, and the future of my, my time in the General Assembly, I'll be making a decision on that pretty soon. But, you know, this is a, I'm not ready to make any announcement on that. I want to still be part of putting together good policy for the state of Illinois in some capacity. I appreciate that answer. W would you be making this same announcement now had House Republicans picked up five seats and not lost five seats? I made a commitment to myself in the primary that I had to win 48 seats. Hold on and pick up three. I fell short. If I would have picked up, if I would hit that 48 and gone above and beyond that, I'd still be here. But I had to, that was a commitment I made to myself and also to my family. And I realized that not only that I come close, we just failed miserably. Everybody did throughout the nation. It's time that for me to say that I leave under my own terms with no reservations, but also now to give somebody else the opportunity to uh, look at this process with a new set of eyes, new energy, a new face, and hopefully we'll be able to restart this process and put their House Republicans in a good spot. And if I'm doing some rough math there, it sounded like you were also just saying you just didn't want to be in the super minority anymore maybe an easier job in the minority at least. You know what, I've had a great, I've had a great run, but you know what, there comes a time in your life when you know that you gotta move on and it's a gut check time. And I did, I made that decision and I'm happy with it. Thanks for your time. Thanks Mark. A swan song from House Republican leader Jim Durkin, Tony McCombie taking his place as of today. And we switch gears now from Illinois to Missouri and from state politics to Congress. We can now report that Republicans will take control of the House. They are in the middle of undergoing a leadership change, dispensing with Speaker, or who would have been Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, instead for Steve Scalise of Louisiana. In the Senate, Republicans will spend the next two years in the minority. 
and Mitch McConnell will retain his grip on the leadership post in that caucus. We caught up with Senator Josh Hawley on the record. Hey, Mark. Hi, Senator Hawley. You, you so, uh, you've spoken rather stark terms about the midterm election results. You said they were the funeral for the Republican Party as we know it. The Republican Party as we have known it is dead, in your words, saying that we're not a majority party. The old party is dead. Time to bury it and build something new. If you're going to eulogize someone, the least you can do is name them. Whose Republican Party is dead? Donald Trump's? Well, I said the party of the last 30 years. I mean, listen, since 1988, the Republicans have won a majority of the popular vote in a presidential election, I think just twice. I, I mean, you can do the math and make sure I'm right about that. But it's been a long time since we have been a consistent majority. And I think what these last elections show is that a lot of independent voters who voted for Barack Obama and then turned around and voted for Donald Trump, who don't like Joe Biden, but did they vote this time? No, a bunch of them stayed home rather than vote for Republicans. I think that ought to tell Republicans something, that you can't just be against the Biden agenda, as terrible as it is. We're going to actually have to go out and appeal to these working class independent voters. And we do that with an agenda that actually protects their jobs, that protects their families, that protects our culture, that secures our border. But Republicans really didn't have any agenda on offer. And I think that's the lesson we've got to learn. Mike Pompeo said this, quote, we need more seriousness, less noise, and leaders who are looking forward not staring in the rearview mirror claiming victimhood. It sounds like he's alluding to the former president who, as you just pointed out, did not win the popular vote in, in 2016. Is Mike Pompeo a part of that new Republican Party you see moving forward or part of the old GOP you're declaring dead? Well, I think that depends on him. I mean, it depends on everybody to decide, are they going to be part of the solution or part of the problem? Are you going to put forward ideas that actually reach out to these voters that we need? We're not going to be a majority party unless we appeal to working people and their families. And we're not going to do that if we keep running on the same old tired stuff. If you keep running on a, a trade agenda that sends our jobs overseas, that impoverishes towns all across our state, like the one that I grew up in, if you're going to keep running on that agenda, you're going to keep losing. If you keep backing the big corporations in Wall Street, overworking Americans, you're going to keep losing. That's my message to the Republican Party. I think voters are trying to send them that message. We'll see who listens. That pro-worker message uh, is a more populist one, might be more popular with the public, but the Associated Press reported that many, you also in, infused in your uh, campaign strategy or your future GOP strategy talk of culture and indoctrination of youth. The Associated Press just said that uh, two-thirds of the candidates who run who ran on platforms like those for school board races lost. Candidates who ran in statewide elections for governor on the same platform about indoctrinating kill, uh, children running against those ideas. Go uh, candidates for governor in Michigan, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Maine all lost. Why do you think that's a winning message? Well, look at Ron DeSantis in Florida. Look at McMaster in North Carolina. Look at Brian Kemp in Georgia. Uh, these are Republicans who ran on a I mean, what was DeSantis boasting about? Florida's where woke comes to die. They had massive margins of that election. That was an election that was about something. You know, the election in New York where you had a strong anti-crime candidate. Yeah, the governor's candidate, he didn't win ultimately. He came awfully close, but Republicans won up and down the ballot in New York on a strong message of protecting families, of getting tough on crime. That's a real message that has real substance to it. That's the kind of thing we as Republicans have to be fighting for. And yeah, I, I do believe 100% protecting our culture, protecting families, protecting parents' rights to say what their kids' medication is going to be. You know, kids shouldn't go to our schools and get indoctrinated, taught to hate this country, taught that their gender isn't the right one and, and they need to transition behind their parents' back. This has got to end. Parents don't want this. Look at Virginia. How did Glenn Youngkin get elected? I think that voters are sending a pretty clear message. The problem is, is that too many Republicans, especially the Washington Republicans, they just haven't been listening. It sounds like you're open to moving on from Donald Trump. Are you open at all to running for president yourself? Oh, I've said that my focus in 2024 is, is being a Senate candidate. I hope that the people of Missouri will have me for another term. There'll be time for more of that later on. But uh, my plan and hope is to run for re-election in 2024. A quick matter back home. A Missouri court just ruled that when you were attorney general, you, quote, knowingly and purposely violated the state's transparency laws in an effort to conceal potentially damaging information and help your political campaign. Now taxpayers are on the hook to pay a $12,000 fine in the attorney general's office. Why should taxpayers pick up the tab? Shouldn't you pay for that? Uh, that's not what the court ruled. The 
court did not find that I did anything wrong. And in fact, this partisan attack, which has been made going back to the last campaign by Claire McCaskill for four years now, Democrats have alleged I did this and that wrong, I violated these laws. There have been multiple investigations, including by a Democrat auditor into me personally. Every one of them has exonerated me, have found no wrongdoing on my part whatsoever, including, as I say, the Democrat auditor, including the Secretary of State. There have been numerous lawsuits and various other pieces of litigation. I've been exonerated every single time. Are, are you suggesting somehow that partisan politics have infected the nonpartisan Missouri plan, the, the Missouri uh, courts are somehow playing politics? No, I'm saying that you don't know how to read an opinion. What your characterization of the decision is totally wrong. You should read it. You should also read the investigative reports of the Secretary of State, the investigative report of the state auditor who investigated me personally based on these baseless attacks, these partisan attacks. You've got Claire McCaskill out there again now amplifying this. This is an attack she started and litigated in the last campaign. It's been disproven every time. I personally have been investigated and exonerated by Democrats in state office every single time. As you can see from time to time on this program, we have to set the record straight. So let's check the record, shall we? Here are some of the court records that Senator Hawley just referenced and asked us to take a closer look. Daniel Hartman is the name of someone who used to work for his AG campaign. He was also the custodian of records for the Attorney General Josh Hawley himself in that government office. Hartman was a state director for Hawley's AG campaign and had a campaign email address. You see that in the court records. Also, when Democrats hit Hartman with a Sunshine Act request searching for public emails on his personal account, he claimed that Hawley's government office retained no documents like that. Turns out that was not true. Later, the American Democracy Legal Fund filed a complaint alleging Hawley used government funds to boost his Senate campaign. That complaint would trigger many of those partisan investigations into Hawley's office, the ones he just referenced. But those investigations were separate from this new court finding. That's key here. The question at hand now is, did the Attorney General's office violate the Sunshine Law by failing to turn over documents that existed on its servers? Cole County Judge John Beatham, a Republican, writes, quote, this court holds that it did. The court says Hawley's office violated the Sunshine Law in at least two ways, failing to provide a detailed explanation for its delay in handing over the documents and by withholding those documents for nearly a year and a half. But did the senator have a point? Was this somehow misinterpreted the way we asked him that question? The court says this, none of the arguments from the attorney general's office justified its violation of the law. Further down on page 13, the court says Mr. Hartman, as a custodian of records, quote, must do his job and warned the attorney general's approach is unprecedented and creates a roadmap for abuse that would allow an agency and its custodian to shield public records merely by storing them off site. Perhaps the most important lines in this new court decision are these. The violations of the Sunshine Law in Attorney General Josh Hawley's office were knowing and purposeful. The court says by failing to produce the records, Mr. Hartman and Hawley's office prevented an opposing party from accessing documents that were potentially damaging to his political campaign. The court says the conduct in Hawley's office supports the court's findings that the violations here were knowing and purposeful. Further, on page 16, the court says the fact that this public business was conducted through and stored on private email accounts is direct contravention of the AGO's official policies. It itself evidence of a cover-up. And one more time, just for emphasis, the judge writes this. A litigant cannot avoid summary judgment by simply denying the veracity of the movement's facts. This court finds Josh Hawley's office knowingly and purposefully violated the Sunshine Law. That is going to cost Missouri taxpayers $12,000, not the Hawley campaign, but $12,000 to Missouri taxpayers. Now, we'll set the record here straight, too. When I asked Senator Hawley the initial question, I said the court found him knowingly and purposely uh, had violated the Sunshine Law, when in fact it said his office had done that and perhaps benefited his campaign. Perhaps Senator Hawley makes a distinction between himself and his office or between himself and his campaign. Perhaps he meant to say that those things went on uh, in his office without his personal knowledge. He didn't answer that question specifically. Maybe that's what he meant. Perhaps he also meant to lay blame on one of his staffers, Daniel Hartman. But our question stands. If his campaign could have benefited from a cover-up, then why are the taxpayers the ones paying for that fine? 
I should also set the record straight on one other fact that was inherent in my question. I asked Senator Hawley if partisan politics might have crept into the nonpartisan Missouri courts plan when in fact the judge who issued this ruling was elected through a partisan process. Turns out not every county in Missouri participates in that nonpartisan Missouri plan that's designed to be a firewall between politics and the judiciary. Judge Beatum was elected in a Republican primary. And just for good measure, we reached out to Senator Hawley's campaign now, the active campaign, just to make sure, would they in fact cover the cost of that $12,000? Here's the response from Kyle Plotkin with the campaign, quote, these allegations are based on Democrat campaign attacks. They have been investigated multiple times and no wrongdoing has been found, including by a Democrat state auditor. Not until this new court ruling found there was a violation of the law. Again, no direct answer on whether or why not the campaign would pick up that tab and leave it with the taxpayers. That does it for us. Until next week, we're off the record.